Good evening and welcome to Talking Songs with me, Roland Jones. And first piece of news is, is my special guest tonight is me. <laughs> Through all sorts of um, circumstances, um, I, I don't have a guest tonight. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about my music, I suppose, and what I've been doing over the years and um, how I got to do different things and write different songs, I suppose. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, the fact today I've done something to my hand and I can't play my guitar, so it's all, it's all it's all back to front tonight. There's no live music; it's just going to be me chatting and some recorded stuff from all over the place. So, all right, where did it start for me? Well, started for me with my cousin John, my cousin John, who taught me eight chords on the guitar one Sunday evening in sunny Swansea, and. Um, Ironically, it was the, uh, the the night before one of my piano exams, and um, I did the piano exam and then kind of stopped playing piano. I passed, passed the exam, but I kind of stopped playing, and I borrowed his, because he had two guitars, one of which his father had brought back from Spain, where he'd been in the Navy, and um, another that he bought, it was an Egmond. I don't know if any of you remember Egmond guitars. Um... But I borrowed that for a while and then um, and then met up with a bunch of guys at, at school and, and we started a band and we had a band called the Dirty Feet Blues Band. And our first gig was supporting a uh, local band um, called Liquid Umbrella. Now, yes, it, it was the 60s after all. Um, and I, I will never forget the sight of them coming on stage after us. <coughs> and then we played six tunes. They came on stage after us and the guy came hurtling on the stage with a black telecaster and they played Foxy Lady. It's a volume that I was very unfamiliar with, like seriously loud and it was brilliant. It was really, really good. Um, yeah, so that was my first my sort of um, baptism of, of, of being anything to do with being in a band. And, and then there, we, we did a couple more gigs. We, we did... Uh, one evening we played at the, the Redcliffe Hotel. Now, the Redcliffe Hotel in Swansea used to be, it was the, the resident band there. It was a band called Love Sculpture. Um, and the guitarist was Dave Edmonds, the great Dave Edmonds. And uh, we played. Unfortunately, we only knew about eight or nine numbers. So we, I think we played Satisfaction about five times. But it was good fun. Of course, by that stage, we'd already had some uh, musical differences and the other guitar player had left. And had been replaced by somebody called Derek Harris. Now, Derek had surprised us all. <coughs> Derek Harris was a very quiet guy. And one evening there'd been um, a, a sort of folk club thing arranged between myself and the girls' school. And uh, <coughs> I got to the end of the, the, the session and people had run out of things to play. I'd already done a song, badly. Um, and... Um, Somebody said, oh, Derek, Derek plays guitar. Let's get, go on. He's like, oh, I don't know. And anyway, we, we persuaded him to get up. Now, we'd been playing Peter, Paul and Mary and, God, Pete Seeger. And I did a Pete Seeger song. And Dylan and Donovan and all that sort of stuff. It was all folky, you know. And um, Derek got this guitar and, and sat down on a stool in, in, in front of us. And there was... It was a bit segregated in a weird sort of way. There's all the sort of nerdy guitar freak males and um, at one end and <laughs> the, the, the women further across with a little bit of interlap in the middle, overlap in the middle. And Derek sat on the stool and said, um, this is a song by Theolonius Monk. And we kind of just looked at each other and said, what? And he played all these amazing jazz chords, fingers all over the place, like, oh, demolished sevenths a lot. It was just unbelievable. And um, bizarrely, um, Derek actually is playing um, next week in Manchester. We're still in touch. And um, I'm doing a gig at uh, Martin Fred's in a few weeks' time um, with Bo and Ian on percussion. And the week after, Derek is there with his band. So if, if you're into jazz, he's a superb player. He's been, been a pro musician all his life, and he's, he's great. He's great. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, was the, that was the Dirty Feet Blues Band. And then there was a bit of a gap. 
And uh, oh, hang on, we've got a comment here. Who's this from? Oh, hi, David. How are you doing? Um, it's Mr. Fee who runs Home Songs. Um, so yeah, so that that was that was the sort of start of the guitar thing for me. And then at university, I I played at folk clubs and stuff like that, and jammed with the guys in the house. I lived with that, that sort of thing. But I didn't actually get into playing with a band until I'd actually left university. And one of the guys that I'd been on on the same course as approached me about playing in a band, so we started playing together. And um, the band was called Half Weight, and. Um, it was the 60s and the 70s. You know, what do you expect? So the early 70s by this stage. And um, it was um, it was good fun. It was good fun. And then, then one night I went to do a gig in Stockport and turned up and the outside the pub there was a, um, a notice that said, um, tonight, Harpoon. And I thought, oh, I've got the wrong bloody day. Um, but it, it was, in fact, that was that was the correct day, and the, and there we were, Harpoon, John Ash, Roland Jones, John Levinson, Mike Smith. Um, where are they now? John Ash is um, still playing over in in Denmark. I met up with him a couple of times. Um, did some recording over there with him some years ago. Mike Smith um, still playing. Uh, did a gig with him just before lockdown, I think. Um, John Levinson has gone off to be a multimillionaire, so we don't talk about him very much. And um, yeah, that was Harpoon, and this, here we have the the um, earliest known photograph of Mr. Roland Jones on guitar. Look at that, a proto goth. What do you reckon? And if there was a um, yeah, I, I think if there was a bit more light in the bottom of the picture, you could probably see my flared trousers. Um, <coughs> but note the um, the compulsory coily lead. Um, which were completely useless. And also, <coughs> excuse me, it marked my, uh, my, my first stage of um, falling in love with Telecasters. That one there is a, um, most people recognise it, they're guitar nerds. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> it's um, a Fender Thin Line, 1969, but without a maple leg, it's got a rosewood fingerboard on it. And somebody stole it out of the back of a van in 1976. And uh, if you ever see or offered a Fender um, Thin Line uh, with the serial number 226445, do get in touch. Yeah, I'm not, am I bitter about it? Of course I'm bitter about it. So, yeah. Um, all right, so let's have, yeah, let's have a, a, a bit of music for now. Let me, let me play a bit of music. This is um, four years ago. Um, this was recorded four years ago tomorrow um, in a place called the Soulshine Pizza in Nashville. And this was three musicians that I'd met, four musicians, four musicians, that I'd met about three minutes earlier. And I said, uh, okay, um, um, Black Cat Blues, Funky and C, and they went, yeah. And this is what we did. <laughs> Thank you. 
just interesting thing interesting I don't go to jam sessions often and one of the reasons I don't go is because it's become so competitive and people want to play and play and play and play if you know if, if you, you may have noticed I'm sure musicians watching will have noticed this that at the point where the guitar player takes his solo he neatly finishes it off at the end of the 12 bar sequence and it's then I have to encourage him to play another one. He wasn't like gonna noodle his way through the evening, he just stopped. But I just loved his play and I just thought I wanted to hear him play more. And uh, it was a, it was a true, truly a mar marvelous occasion. I, I, I would have let it run right to the end because there's one very important bit at the end where you hear this, <laughs> this yelp of yeah <laughs> from Leslie shouting over the crowd. Um, which is an important link to the next part of the story, really, because she's uh, always supporting me in, in what I'm doing. And um, so, yeah, the next next part of the story involved uh, me meet, meeting Leslie. Obviously, this that was 2017. We're going back now to 2005. Um, uh, Leslie and I met, um, got married, and decided to move to Italy. And... Um, yeah <laughs> yeah just like that uh, and we got there and um I, I was keen to play music and um I'd, I'd lived there before and but i'd always played jazz then and i decided i wanted to go back into playing the blues and um what happened was through people that i, I that i already knew out there i got invited along to kind of audition for a band and when i got there i um I suddenly realised that they were expecting me to sing as well because I was the only person who spoke English and therefore I was the one who would have to be the singer. I happened to have with me in my guitar case um, the words to a song which has since kind of become a bit of an anthem for me. And um, the the point was I'd started writing. I, I, I bought this fancy recorder, Gubbins, and I'd started trying to record the backing track in it because I wanted to record The Thrill Is Gone. I will come back to that song again in a minute. But um, I did this kind of groove and I, I thought, oh, I, I like that. Um, I don't want to use it for somebody else's song. I'll use it for mine. So I wrote the words to this song. And that song, as I say, became a bit of an anthem for me. And this is me with my Italian band. <laughs> No, I've never been to Memphis 
I've never been to Tennessee But I've been down to the crossroads And everybody appears by me
cosa I love the fact in that that um, Jadlin with the drummer just pl just moves it around a bit. He doesn't do anything flash. He's not all over the place. He's just subtly. They were they are great musicians. Guido Pietrella, <coughs> I'm so excited. Guido Pietrella on the bass and Gianluca Meconcelli on drums. And we played as a trio for for, for several years. And um, they were just such a joy to play with. Um, they they'd been playing together since they were about sixteen, I think, and and yeah, they're great players, great players. And whenever we go back to Italy, um, we managed to get at least one gig in with them. Um, the last time we were there was the Trasimene Blues Festival, in two thousand nineteen, um, where we were where we were booked to play, um, which was lovely just to be back playing with them again. Um, but having said that, having said that, I say my band, they, they, they were my band, but I also played with, with other great musicians. And, and the next thing I'm going to play is with a band called the Trans Transfusion Trio. Um, <laughs> it's not easy, isn't it, when you're getting excited? Um, this is um, Enrico Giovaniola on, uh, on sax and, and keys, Giacomo Rossetti on bass, and um, Matteo Gili on drums. Now... What happened was that we, we were sort of playing, sometimes I'd play with one band, sometimes I'd play with the other band, depending on the venue, because quite often we used to play in a trio without, without drums. But on this occasion, it was, it was a four-piece. Um, Giacomo Rossetti has, I think he was only about like 19 when I met him. He's now the bass player with a, a, a very, very successful Italian band called uh, Negrita. And um, he is a truly amazing player. In fact, they're all amazing play. Enrico, a great, fantastic sax sound. I just love the. the it's uh, it's a great player, and a, and a lovely, lovely guy. They're all easy guys to work with. Um, Matteo, I only did a couple of gigs with, but a fantastic, lovely player. So this is a this is a thing that we play for a festival in um, in Umbria, and um, I think about half an hour before we went on, there was this horrendous thunderstorm. And it was an, it's an open stage, as you'll see. And um, it was a bit worrying because there were cables all over the place in, in pools of water. But um, they said, we're going to do it. So we said, OK, fair enough. So, so we did it. And, um, and this is a track we did. It's, uh, the song is The Thrill Is Gone. The, the, the arrangement is, is mine, basically. Um, but I got the idea from... A recording of the thrill is gone by uh, an American guitar player called Zachary Bro. Um, he does it more more complexly than this, but the essential thing about it is that you, you play a twelve bar sequence, but you don't play the four chord. For those of you of a, of a, of a theoretical bent out there, so this is Roland Jones and then Transfusion Trio um, with the thrill is gone. <laughs> The thrill is gone, the thrill is gone away. The thrill is gone, the thrill is gone away. I 
I get over you, but you'll be sorry one day. David Fee just said uh, great sound. Yes, it was a great sound. The other thing I have to point out at this point, point out at this point, point out at this, at this moment, that Leslie 
stood and held the camera high in order to film that right the way through. No tripod, nothing, no artificial stimulants, just holding a camera up in the air trying to film the band. That's devotion for you. It's wonderful, isn't it? And yeah, the sound is great. And the sound is remarkable considering it was just off a little compact um, camera. I can't remember what, what make it is now, but uh, Panasonic, I think it is. Um, but great. And the, 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 the band was just just beautiful to play with, as was with, with the other bunch of guys. <laughs> Thank you, darling. She just, it was love. See, there you go. And... Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, it's, it was just a joy to play with those guys. And um, what happened in the end was that uh, Giacomo went off to um, play with Negrita. And Matteo had come down, especially from, from Florence, to do that gig with us. And what happened is that the three-piece with Guido and, um, and Jan Lou, we incorporated <laughs> Enrico into that. So it became a four-piece band, which was, which was great fun. Um, yes, for the, the guitar nerds amongst you out there, um, you've noticed by this stage I, I'm, I'm firmly committed to a Telecaster. Um, it's a GNLA SAT, which I bought in about 92, something like that. It's um, second hand, sounds beautiful. Um, it's absolutely standard. The only thing I've changed on it, it's got like a, a four way switch so you can have bridge pickup, neck pickup. Or both of them in series, or both of them in parallel, just to add one slightly extra tone to it. Um, but lovely guitar through um, a Cornford Harlequin amp, um, which they no longer make. It's a 22 watt hand built Class A amp, valve amp. Um, so, uh, <laughs> any more questions on the details? So yeah, so that was uh, that was early on when when I was out there. Then uh, I carried on playing with um, with Jan Lu and Guido, and as I say that. When I go back now, we, we, we still manage to get a gig or, or so in. Um, this is this is another track I recorded. This this one was, this is a song that um, I wrote in 2013. So it would have been just before we uh, we moved back to the UK. And, um, you know, I've talked to lots of songwriters about where do ideas for songs come from. And th the thing for this one was basically based around two ideas one was the, the the title which is two steps back um because one of the things that there's lots of like, idiomatic expressions that we have um in in every language has them and english has lots of them and sometimes you, you find that they, they actually exist identically in a in a, uh, in, in a, a different language in my case italian because i don't speak any other language um and I think that's what this we would we'd been discussing sort of um, different uh, the the origin of different expressions and the, you know, the one step forward two steps back sprang to mind, and the other uh, uh, the other idea behind it was the opening chord which is a it's an E minor seventh but with a fifth sharpened I don't know what, what I'm not sure what that's called, so I turned up with this tune um, one morning for a rehearsal and. Um, Sorry, I say morning. No, it was about half past 11, which is morning for those guys. Um, everything is kind of slipped in Italy. You know, the, 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 the day starts late and, and ends late. You know, on one occasion, I was booked to do a gig at 11 o'clock in February, and I ended up doing it at quarter past two um, in March because it was <laughs> the last day of February. Um, but there you go, it happens. The... Um, yeah, so I turned it with this song and we were booked to play the following night uh, for a wine festival in a town quite close to where we lived. And um, the thing was, these two guys had worked together for, for forever. And sometimes, although my Italian's good, there were certain things that they, they'd have a quick exchange of, of, of phrases and they, they'd go off into something which I didn't expect. And that's exactly what happened with this. I played played the chords through and they muttered something to each other and and then they 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 hit this groove and i i think it's just just a, a beautiful arrangement i think it, it works a treat so this is uh, two steps back
Every week you tell me it's over But one day later it's all back on I don't know what the hell you are thinking I don't know what planet you are on I don't understand how you see things You see everything in black and black Don't go ahead One step forward groove in there somewhere I think um, I think it's great great cracking cracking great session thank you guys um, so yeah so that was seven years of my life out there with those people I've got somebody else to mention but I, I'll mention him towards the end so at that point we came back to the UK and um, we got back to Manchester um, the people I played in in bands with and people I knew from the from music I mean they'd either packed it in or they'd moved away or or died 
Um, not many of them, unfortunately, at that point. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I started playing a lot more acoustic guitar because I was going to going to meet people in, in you know, in open mic nights and stuff like that, which, which, which weren't a treat. Um, so the next couple of songs I'm gonna, gonna play are ones that I've written recently. Now, um, again, for the, um, for the guitar enthusiasts out there, the, um, I mean, well, I've got a comment in here. Oh, round of applause from David. Thank you, David. Um, the, the guitar that I bought when I came back, um, well, I decided I wanted a, a decent acoustic. Is not the one I used on, the, on these next two <laughs> tunes, bizarrely. Um, I bought this beautiful Taylor, which um, is, is resting here, close. Beautiful guitar. Um, and I've, uh, I've had a lot of fun with that one. But a few years ago, I was taken by... Um, an article I saw in a, in a guitar magazine. I don't buy guitar magazines. I haven't bought a guitar magazine apart from this one edition for probably 30 years. I've actually got about 60 downstairs which date back to the 70s and, and, and then the 80s. Um, but in, in terms of recent... And I don't, the only reason I bought this magazine was that um, a friend of mine who would, had been reviewing some pedals for this particular mag and I thought I'll be interested. And... Um, I got it, and uh, in the middle, I found there was a review of uh, of some three uh, Eastman guitars. Now, um, I'm not sponsored by any of these manufacturers, incidentally. I'm just doing this because I'm telling you what my experiences are. And I, I bought this, which is a, I mean, you know, it, it's clearly designed to to emulate, you know, the the early Gibsons. Um, and it had rave reviews, absolute rave reviews. And they said, it, if you can get one, get one. <laughs> and um, in like me, I, I don't normally do things on impulse. I tend to assess things, you know, check them, price, blah, blah, blah. I phoned up Sounds Great, which was then my, my local music store, which is no more, I'm afraid. And they, um, I said, have you got, there were three models. And I said, have you seen the review? Have you got any of them in? And they said, yeah, we've only got one left. And it was the one I wanted. And so I went up, played it, and I thought, yeah, this is lovely. So um, the next couple of tunes um, were written on that. The first one is called, um, um, which one shall I play first? Always Thought. Yeah, this is a, this is a sort of bluesy tune. Um, yeah, I don't think, I'm not sure what else I can say about it, but here we go. This is called Always Thought. <laughs> I'm 
would run off with a sailor or disappear with a smooth billionaire. I never thought you'd ever want to leave me. I always thought you'd always be there. Here's a little bit of advice. If you want the gravelly sound, record early in the morning. If you don't, then don't. <laughs> yes, um, that was recorded early one Monday morning. Um, uh, it's not my greatest uh, performance, but I think it works like that. Um, but just I've just realised this thing. It was something I meant, meant to mention earlier. I was talking about Telecasters. And um, in the last tune that I was doing there, I was playing a Tom Anderson shorty. Now... Um, Tom Anderson was the the head of the Fender Custom Shop up until a certain point. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think it was the mid seventies or the mid eighties. I'm not quite sure which. And he set up this company called Tom Anderson Guitars, and they are beautiful, beautiful to play. But they make two kinds of guitars. They make Ones that look like ordinary Telecasters and Strats and stuff like that. And they do the other ones, which are all in the fancy woods with, you know, very... Now, when I lived in Italy, the only ones I could find in Italy were the fancy woods. I didn't want the fancy woods. I wanted a Telecaster that looked like a Telecaster. And um, they weren't cheap. And um, so what I did was this. I went on their site and went through the options because they're all built to spec. And um, I went through the options and ticked all the boxes the way I wanted it to be. And then using that as part of my uh, my Google search mechanism, I, I searched out a second-hand one. And I found one in Minneapolis. Now, those of you with a basic understanding of geography will know that central Italy and Minneapolis aren't that close together. So actually dropping into the shop didn't seem uh, like a, a likely occurrence. But I went through it and I thought, well, the only thing I might have done differently would be the 
the curvature of the neck. I might have wanted a shallower neck because this was quite a quite a chunky feel neck from the, from the description. So I thought, all right, well, I'll order it. And um, my wife bought it for me. She did. She did. She just came into money, a little bit of money when her when her mother died, and she spent some of it buying my guitar for me, which I was wonderful. I will. Not only will she stand there for 20 minutes holding a camera in the air, she'll buy me a guitar as well. I mean, what, 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 what more can you want? Um, and there's a lot more than that. So she bought this for me and I took it out of the box, plugged it in and I thought, this is wonderful. And because um, I, I was thinking, well, I could shave the neck or get the neck shaver. No, it is just a gorgeous guitar. If you don't know what a Tom Anderson is like, try one. It's called a Tom Anderson Shorty because it's a short T. It's a Telecaster, but it's got a shorter scale, which is like a Gibson length. So it's a 24.75 scale, as opposed to a 25 and something or other, which is a standard Telecaster. And it plays like a dream. It's quite bizarre in the sense that most, um, most solid bodied guitars have four bolts to hold the neck on. This one only has two, but there's no, there's no movement in it at all. Um, the other beautiful thing about it is that the body is chambered, so it weighs nothing. It weighs absolutely nothing. You know, some Telecasters and Strats, and particularly Les Paul, is going to weigh a ton, but this doesn't weigh anything. So that was the, um, yeah, I can't fault it. End of story. So Tom Anderson Shorty, yes, 12 out of 10. So where were we? Yeah, um, yeah, the Eastman. So that, that one other song... I've got two other songs to play, but this this is one on the Eastman, um, and um, I'm very I'm very partial to a sort of a boss and over groove, and um, it's that that alternating thumb on the bass thing I, I really quite like, and uh, but I don't necessarily want to do a, a straight boss and over. I'm, it, it's the purists would probably say this is nowhere near a bossa nova. It's just what you do, Roland, which is probably true, but it's all right. It works. So this is a song called A Million Ways. I, I have this thing about list songs, which I, I, I it, it's quite common in songwriting. It goes back to the, you know, the, the 30s, I suspect. If you, if you look back to the great American songbook, you'll find there's lots of songs that do this. It do, I did this, I did that, I did that, I did this. And uh, there was one of these, two of those, four of those, and five. You know, that, that sort of idea where you repeat the format. And um, this is one of those songs, and this is called A Million Ways. I tried to say how much I need you. Tried as hard as I could. Try to explain a thousand times, but my words just weren't that good. Thought that you would be my future. Be one of the greatest loves You said you'd love me Forever and ever But let me say forever never comes Cause there's two sides To every story A dozen ways to sing a song Only one way To say that you're sorry A million ways to get things wrong You said goodnight As you walked away But I knew you meant goodbye Turned all of my way. I just 
just wanted one more try Two sides to every story A dozen ways to sing a song I'm not the guy who has a way with words Me, I always get it wrong Just can't say the way that I feel If I do it much better in this song Two sides to every story A dozen ways to sing a song Only one way to say that you're sorry A million ways to get things wrong Two sides to every story A dozen ways To sing a song Only one way To say that you're sorry A million ways To get things wrong I forgot I did a bit of scatting at the end there. So that's it. Um, there you go. A little bit about me and my songs and people I've played with and things I've enjoyed doing. So, um, yeah, it's nice to uh, think back about Gianluca and Guido. Hopefully I'll be back playing with them shortly and Enrico. Um, Giacomo will be off playing to 60,000 seater stadiums as usual. Um, but uh, yeah, I miss all those guys. I miss all those guys a lot. And um, you've probably also got an inkling of how much Leslie has helped me on, on this venture. I'm not going to say journey. I'm fed up with people doing journeys. <laughs> but yeah, she's enormous help to me. And... Um, I'm going to kind of sign off here, but leave you with, with one other thing. Um, there was somebody else that I met in Italy um, who um, died away, died, died, passed away. About, well, I, think, I can't remember. Was it a year ago or two years ago? I can't remember. I'm sorry. Um, it seems like yesterday, but it, anyway. I was playing with a band. Sorry, this is why I've left this till last, because I'm going to get... Anyway, I was playing with a band in the next village along, and the friend of mine came up and said, um, well, this is a friend of mine, and he's a guitar player, and he's looking for other people to play with, and he can't find anybody that he wants to play with, but he likes what you do, so maybe you should get together. So he came round to my house, and uh, we sat there. Now, this is a guy who comes from a sort of classical flamenco that sort of groove um child prodigy just won awards when he was like six and seven years old um he did want to play guitar <laughs> ironically at this at one point but nevertheless he, he carried on with it and uh, so we sat there and uh we uh we never to be a bottle of nero davola there and um which was his is his, his tipple of choice and, and ever since has become associated with him and um, we sat there and we were kind of like doodling away like you do I, we didn't know where we were going really and I didn't know where at the start and he didn't know where at the start and then suddenly he started doing this amazing rhythmic thing with them. not the sort of a, a bit of the rasquiado you know where, you, where they, they trail their fingers down the flank of players and he started doing this and I just started soloing over it. And we came up with this 
and, we, and, the, and the piece sort of went in one direction, it went in another direction. It was, and and it said, so we suddenly reached a point and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And suddenly we both stopped at exactly the same, as if it had been well rehearsed. And we just stopped dead and burst out laughing. And the pair of us were giggling like idiots. And um, it was just magic. And uh, Leslie said to me after, she said, it's, it's bizarre. She said, you sounded like you'd played together since you were kids, you know. And um, that was Carmelo, Carmelo Russo. We had a, a duo together, which we called Jamencoos, because it was a bit of jazz, a bit of flamenco and a bit of blues. So, But we, we did this bizarre mix of a couple of Django Reinhardt tunes, um, uh, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, um, some jazz standards and some of my songs and this song which is called the gypsies jazz which is one that we wrote makes it sound too formal a process this is something that we created that night and uh played it dozens and dozens of times um i was very sad when he died and uh, i shall always miss him so thanks for listening and i'm going to leave you with Jamenkus and the Gypsies Jazz. Thank you.